everybody. Welcome to First Christian Church Online. I'm lead pastor Matthew Craig, and I'm glad you're with us. We're in week three of our series called In His Presence. Today we're going to be talking about presence or people. I hope you'll stick around, and I hope you'll stay to the very end. Today, um, it truly is about you and me, people. And so for that, I'd like to pray for you before we begin. Father, thank you for those watching. Father, for whatever reason they clicked on this link today, I pray that they will hear your message. They will hear your call. Father, they will be renewed, restored. They will be reconciled to you by placing their faith in Jesus. Father, it's not about presence today, but it truly is about your presence. So we invite you to be a part of today. Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, may those who will watch this find encouragement, find a way back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everything I needed to know, I learned from a kindergartner. It's a poem. And Robert Fulgham tells a story in one of his books about a seminar he took in Greece with a professor of ancient Greek philosophy. I may not get this name right, but Dr. Papadopoulos. At the end of that week-long class, the professor finished his lecture and asked, are there any questions? Robert raised his hand and said, I have one. What's the meaning of life? The class laughed, but... The professor could see by the look on Fulgram's face that it was a serious question. Dr. Papadopoulos said, I will tell you my answer. And he opened his wallet and he pulled out a small piece of mirror, a piece of glass. And then he told this story. When I was a small child during the war, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found a broken piece of glass. It was a mirror from a German motorcycle. The motorcycle had been wrecked. I tried to find all the pieces to put them back together again, but I couldn't. So I kept the largest piece. I scratched it on a stone. I scratched it on the ground and I eventually made that mirror round with smooth edges. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun could never reach. You see, by reflecting light into this mirror, I could reach deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me. It was a game to get the light into the most inaccessible places I could find. And I kept that little mirror. As I went about growing up, I would take it out from time to time in idle moments, and I would continue the challenge of the game to put light into dark places. As I became a man, I, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but it was a great metaphor for what I might do with my life. You see, I came to understand that I'm not the light or the source of the light, that's Jesus. But light, truth, understanding, knowledge, it's all there, it's all accessible but it won't shine in all the dark places unless I reflect it. You see, I'm a fragrant, I'm a fragment of that mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the dark places, into the dark hearts of men and women. I can change some things and some people Perhaps others may do the same. See, this is what I'm about. This is the meaning of light. To shine light into the places of this world that are dark. This is also the meaning of Christmas, isn't it? The light has come into the world. Jesus of Bethlehem. Emmanuel, God with us, 
the light into the world. You and I are invited to receive that light and to celebrate it, to share it. The world needs more light and love, more compassion, more kindness, more justice, more understanding, more forgiveness. The world needs more light. Or does it? I see, I think the light has been given. All the light that is needed is there. More light's not what's needed. More re- people reflecting the light. That's needed greatly. Today we're, we're celebrating um, in our church services, uh, in, in-house, our candlelight service. It's one of our most favorite times of the year. Now, typically, we've, we've had our candlelight service closer to Christmas Eve, but because of how Christmas fell and, and how we wanted to make space for families, we wanted to share with you our candlelight message today on December 18th. Now, if you're watching this early enough, maybe there's still time to get to church to take part at our 1030, but more than likely not. So I'd encourage you wherever you're at today, Let's find a candle, get it in front of you, take part. See, we're in week three of our Christmas series called In His Presence, and our first week, Phil did a great job of talking about God's promises. Last week, I shared with you how God's peace is available, and through God's promises and through God's peace, we can we can come into His presence. We can we can find space to to enter into his presence. Now, I'm going to be talking about um, light today, and and I'm going to be talking to you about a tradition that I didn't grow up with, um, nor does our church tradition practice much of it, even at all. Now, you may practice it individually as a family, or you may even go to other churches that that practice the the tradition of Advent. But over the last several years, I've grown to love more and more the early Christian calendar. Now, it's not found in the Bible anywhere, but it's a calendar that was used by the early churches to, to mark important moments. It's a series of events and celebrations that have been practiced from very early on in many different ways, in many different faiths. Many different denominations practice them differently. One of those traditions, one of those early celebrations was, was Advent. Now, many of you probably know Advent a lot better than I do, but I find it interesting. I find there's a depth of imagery that's exciting for me. Now, I want to give you just the cliff notes of Advent here right as we start. There are four Sundays of Advent, and in most Anglican churches and in most mainline denominations in America, you you will find what is called an Advent wreath, and the greenery even represents things. And and I don't have a wreath here, but I, I do have the four candles, the three purple, one pink, and one larger candle in the middle, a, a white candle. And I want to just briefly tell you, give you the cliff notes, if you will, of these candles. Each Sunday, a new candle is is lit to mark the time, the, the date. There's three purple, one pink, and one white. And on the fourth Sunday of Advent, all four candles are lit. And then on Christmas Eve, the Christ candle is lit, along with all four Advent candles. The Christ candle is the white, larger candle in, in the middle. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I love what he said. He said, celebrating Advent means learning how to wait, learning how to slow down. He said, waiting is an art which our impatient age has forgotten. And I would agree even more now that more so than what Bonhoeffer even could imagine, the pace in which we live life, the instant gratification that we have, 
by swiping left or swiping right. Our age is impatient. Our age needs instant gratification. And when it doesn't happen, when we have to wait too long in the fast food line, when our, our, uh, our wishes don't come true immediately, when, when we don't hear God's action, we don't see God's action in the, in the prayers that we pray immediately, we, we kind of lose our minds. We want to pluck the fruit before it has had time to ripen, Bonhoeffer says. Greedy eyes are soon disappointed when what they saw as luscious fruit is sour to the taste. In disappointment and disgust, they throw it away. The fruit full of promise rots on the ground. It is rejected without thanks by disappointed hands. He went on to say, the blessedness of waiting is lost on those who cannot wait. The fulfillment of promise is never theirs. They want quick fixes, quick answers to the deepest questions of life. And they miss the value of anxious waiting. They miss the value of seeking with patient uncertainty. They miss the value of waiting until the answers come. They lose the moment. They lose the moment when the answers are revealed in dazzling clarity. Bonhoeffer was right. We do need to learn to wait. We do need to learn to be a, be a people who truly understand Christmas, the anticipation, the excitement. Amazon has completely lost that. Amazon has caused us to completely lose that, I should say. Me and our kids have been watching um, a Disney show called The Santa Clauses, and it's a, it's a series right now um, that takes Scott Calvin and, and takes him through, through life. And, and he has to turn over being Santa Claus to a new Santa Claus. And in this story, um, this this new guy comes and he wants to make Christmas every day. And then by making Christmas every day, Christmas loses its value. I think there's some truth in that. You see, we can devalue the anticipation. We can devalue waiting on God. Because there is a blessing in the wait. I think we'll learn more about what that blessing is here in just a moment. Let me, let me go over these candles. The first candle, the purple candle, symbolizes hope. It's sometimes called the prophecy candle. In remembrance of the prophets, especially Isaiah, who foretold the birth of Christ, it, it represents the expectation felt in anticipation of the coming Messiah. Hosea 12.6, so now come back to your God, act with love and justice and always depend on him. I love how the English Standard Version puts it, so you, by the help of your God, return. Come back, hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. There is truly something special when we wait, when we slow down, and when we enter into the presence of God. God is always with us, and we're always able to go to Him. But sometimes we need to go to Him in anticipation, not demanding that our way is right that our prayer is what is needed. But waiting patiently. The second candle of Advent is also a purple candle. It represents faith. It's 
called the Bethlehem Candle. Is, it's a reminder of Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. Now, the third candle is a pink candle, and it symbolizes joy. It's called the shepherd's candle. It's pink because it's a liturgical color for joy. This third Sunday of Advent is, is also known as a good, uh, God um, Guditi Sunday. I probably butchered that. But it's meant to remind us of the joy that was found in the world as the world experienced the birth of Jesus. It's also the, the joy that those who were faithful found as they waited. George Whitefield, George Whitfield, was delivered from the burden. He said, I was delivered from the burden that had so heavenly suppressed me. The spirit of mourning was taken from me, and I knew what it was to truly rejoice in God my Savior. Sometimes it's in those moments of waiting and anticipation. It's in those moments of, of deep sorrow or grief. or It's in those moments of, of not knowing all the answers that we truly experience joy. The fourth week of Advent is the final purple candle. And it is lit to mark the final week of prayer and penance as we wait for the birth of our Savior. The final candle is known as the angel's candle. It symbolizes peace. It reminds us of the message that the angels gave us, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The white candle is placed in the middle of the wreath and lit on Christmas Eve. This candle is called the Christ candle, and it represents the life of Christ. The color white is for his purity, because Christ is our sinless, pure Savior. The Christ candle represents the light that the Son brought into the world. God in the flesh. And the fact that the Advent candles remain on Christmas Eve puts the focus on this special moment of his birth, the moment of transition from prophecy to fulfillment. And then on Christmas Day, on Christmas Sundays, the Advent candles are usually removed and all is left is the Christ candle. This reminds us that the old things have passed away and that all things have been made new. Ephesians, Paul tells us in chapter 4, verse 17, The Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wonder from the life God gives them because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts. They have no sense of shame. They live for their lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old self, your old life. Throw off the former ways of living. Instead, put on a new life. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts. Let the Spirit renew your attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God. Righteous and holy. Now there's often some Sundays after Advent, and we won't get into those today, but the Epiphany follows on January 6th. Many churches burn the Christ candle through um, December 25th to January 6th. And the Feast of the Light, as some traditions practice, remind us that there was a star and the wise men followed and led them to the birth, to the baby Jesus. And in the baby Jesus, they found fulfillment. They saw the light. N.T. Wright says, it's hard to think of anything else the church does that's more beautiful than a Christmas candlelight service. There's a radiance, a sparkle, a warmth a vibrancy, an aliveness to it all. So simple and yet captivating, inviting and inspiring. And it's all centered around the one candle, the Christ candle, the one we've waited for. 
And as we've waited, we've seen the fulfillment of all things. And now we are to take this light into the world. And our candlelight service that we take part in every year should remind us the imagery that we have as Christians, the depth of the life that we have in Christ. We get our light from Jesus. It's not our brilliant light that we're trying to shine. It's the light of God. It's his love. It's, it's Christ. We've received this through, through Jesus. But it's like that mirror. We're to reflect his light into the dark places. He told us that we were loved. And so we should go love. He demonstrated for us how we should live. So we should go live. His compassion for people in the scriptures that we see, is, and it's especially the compassion to those that are vulnerable on the outskirts of society, to the lepers. It's that kind of love. It's that kind of healing words and actions that truly make a difference. Matthew records Jesus' words. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all of the sea so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The Apostle John wrote, we love because Christ first loved us. And in turn, we let our goodness shine we let our goodness go to all people. We live a life of goodness and generosity to others because that's what Jesus has done for us. That's what this candle represents. And that's why this is the only one that remains on Christmas. And we're to take this light, this Jesus, and we're to share him with one another. When we come together, we realize that we're, no, we're not individuals. You see, our, our, our togetherness, our community together is truly greater than the sum of the parts. But unfortunately, we live in a world that is more worried about what we're concerned about. Our likes, what we care about. And if our needs aren't met, then we're disgruntled. We're angry. We're disgusted. But that's not what the Christ candle tells me to do. The Christ, tell, the Christ candle, Jesus himself tells me not to think of myself, but, but to think of others instead. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Do you want to be treated like trash? Then treat people like trash. You want to be around people full of rudeness? Then be rude. But if you want to be a people of forgiveness and compassion and joy, then be a person of forgiveness, compassion, and joy. Martin Luther once said, when I'm alone in my room trying to pray, my faith is often dried up within me. But when I am in the great congregation singing and praising to God, praying to God, my faith is reborn. You see, we're going to light candles in our service and we're all going to do it together. And we're not just celebrating individual lights. We're celebrating one light. The Christ candle. And we all stand in unity under His life. It's not because of us. It's because of him. And we take his light, not our goodness, not our wants, not our desires. We take his wants and his desires into a broken world for all people to see. I want to leave you. <clears throat> with a poem called Letter to Santa. 
And I hope you'll listen to the very end. Snowflakes, snowflakes softly falling. Upon your window they play. Your blankets snug around you into sleep you drift away. I bend to gently kiss you when I see that on the floor there's a letter neatly written and I wonder who it's for. I quietly unfold it, making sure you're still asleep. It's a Christmas list for Santa, one my heart will always keep. It started just as always with toys you've seen on TV, a new watch for your father and a winter coat for me. But as my eyes read on, I could see deep inside there was many more things you wished for that your loving heart would hide. You asked if your friend Molly could have another dad. It seems her father hits her, and it makes you very sad. Then you asked, dear Santa, if the neighbors down the street could find a job because they might need some food and clothes and heat. You saw a family on the news whose house had been blown away. Dear Santa, send them just one thing, a place where they can stay. And Santa, those four cookies I left for you as a treat, would you take them to the children who have nothing else to eat? Do you know that little bear I have, the one I love so dear? I'm leaving it for you to take to Africa this year. And as you fly your reindeer on this night of Jesus' birth, could you bring to everyone goodwill and peace on earth? There's one last thing before you go. So grateful I would be if you'd smile at baby Jesus in the manger by our tree. I pulled the letter close to me. I felt it melt my heart. Those tiny hands had written what no other could impart. And a little child shall lead them, was whispered in my ear as I watched you sleep on Christmas Eve while Santa Claus was here. Go forth, share the light. The world needs more light. Be of good cheer and courage. Hold fast to what is good. Pay no one back for the evil they deserve. Strengthen the weak and the faint-hearted. Do something for others that they could not do for themselves. Love all people because they've been created in the image of God. And when they can't be loved, their hearts are too hardened. Simply pray to the one above. Love the Lord with all your heart. Everything that you do, do as if you were doing it for Him. Keep in step with the Spirit. And may the blessing of God, the Creator, the Son, the Holy Spirit, may He remain with you as you always reflect His light. 
the light that comes from Christ. God bless you. I hope that you have a Merry Christmas. We're here next week in service. Um, we will not be having an online service for Christmas. So next week, if you're unable to be here, uh, we pray for you. And may you gather around family. And may you always, always know that you have a place here with us. Next Sunday, December 25th, we'll be here at 11 a.m. And then on December 24th, we will also be having a, a Christmas service for those of you who can't make it on the 25th. That service will be at 4 o'clock. So next week, December 24th at 4 p.m. and December 25th at 11 a.m. More information at our website, scottsburg.church. We hope to see you here. God bless you and have a great week. Go be his life.